and flourished into the greatest power on Earth for many centuries. At their peak, it has been estimated that 95% of English money was in the form of tally sticks. Compare that to today, where the only debt-free government issued money is in the form of coin, about 3% of the money supply in the UK and far less in the US. After democratizing the money power of the nation with tally sticks, King Henry then began decentralizing political power as well. King Henry granted something called the Charter of Liberties, voluntarily stating what his powers were under law. Before that, kings had assumed unlimited power. This was followed in 1215 by the Magna Carta, the basis of the U.S. Constitution. A new class began to develop, the merchant class. Trade routes grew, and new towns sprang up along them. This mercantile class needed stability, and so they supported the king, his strong central government, and the rule of law. In 1265, the first parliamentary elections were held. Government by the people in England was born. As money poured into the middle class, the small business persons of the day, feudalism began to break down, and the English Renaissance was born. By the 1600s, serfdom in England was legally banned. Humanity, at least in England, was finally set free. Literature flourished. Now there was money to support artistic endeavors like the plays of William Shakespeare. The nation was at ease due to a debt-free money. Although life in the Middle Ages was certainly not easy by today's standards, once tally sticks were killed and the nation became indebted to bankers, it got worse. After 600 years, the money changers were finally able to begin to reassert their control over English money when they convinced the Parliament to create the Bank of England. This put the banking community back in control of manipulating the quantity of English money. Now England had to borrow its money supply from banks and pay interest on it instead of the government simply issuing its own money without such debt. So in England, we learned that simple sticks of wood broke the monopoly of gold money. This debt-free money lasted for seven centuries and allowed a small island nation to rule the waves and freedom to root deeply in the new middle class. With the goldsmiths back in control, England was now financing its wars with this bank loan money. Just 75 years later, England's war debts consumed 75% of its budget. Three quarters of British taxes were spent just on paying the interest on its war bonds. As a result, England needed to squeeze more and more money from all her colonies to pay the interest on this new growing debt. America was no exception. Pre-revolutionary America was still relatively poor. There was a severe shortage of precious metal coins to trade for goods. So the early colonists were increasingly forced to experiment with printing their own homegrown paper money. This paper money was called colonial scrip. Colonial scrip was a dangerous concept for bankers. It broke the colonies free of the privately owned central bank system where money had to be created by banks and then loaned to governments, as Franklin put it. In the colonies, we issue our own money. It is called colonial scrip. We control its purchasing power, and we have no interest to pay to no one. In 1764, the British Parliament passed the Currency Act. Again, it ordered all Americans to pay their taxes in gold or silver coin. To Ben Franklin, this return to a gold money system was the basic cause for the American Revolution. The colonies would gladly have borne the little tax on tea and other matters had it not been that England took away from the colonies their money, which created unemployment and dissatisfaction. Americans were mad and did everything they could to get around Britain's gold money system. In 1765, Parliament passed the Stamp Act requiring that certain printed materials had to have a stamp placed on them indicating that a tax had been paid and paid in gold. This is what drove America to open revolt. Do you understand what that means? Without gold, you could literally buy or sell nothing. Why? 
because the British had successfully forced the colonies to pay for everything using only a precious commodity, gold. This is the very definition of the word plutocracy, rule by the rich. These people that deal with gold and silver only have never spent one minute of actually trying to figure out how it worked in history, how it would work in real life, and the only way they can support their gold theories is they just treat it as religion and said, we don't have to understand it, we just know that that's God's money and it'll work, and that's not true. By the outbreak of the revolution in April 1775, the colonies started printing a new form of paper money to finance the war. It was called continental currency because unlike colonial scrip, it was the first issued by the new central government. Continentals were great at first, but then the British started counterfeiting it massively, sending it to America literally by the bale. By the end of the war, the currency was virtually worthless. As George Washington lamented, a wagon load of money will scarcely purchase a wagon load of provisions. Earlier, colonial scrip had worked because just enough was issued to facilitate trade and counterfeiting was minimal. In other words, the quantity was controlled by the government that issued it. Gold bugs today try to claim that because paper money didn't work during the Revolutionary War, it shouldn't be used today. But keep in mind, it doesn't matter what backs your money. All that matters is who controls its quantity. Will it be your elected officials? or will it be some unelectable banker? Colonial paper money before the revolution had worked so well that the Bank of England had Parliament outlawed and forced America to use only gold money, gold which they controlled. In our next stop on the Yellow Brick Road, which represents the banker's gold money system, we find how the curse of the privately owned central bank first came to America. In 1781, towards the end of the war, the Continental Congress met here in Philadelphia. They pondered what to do about their grave financial situation. The money was so worthless that people papered their walls with it. Congress finally agreed to give a group of bankers a monopoly on creating U.S. money by loaning it to the government. It was the first privately owned central bank. The plan, of course, was modeled on the Bank of England. The new bank would be called the Bank of North America. It would be the first of a string of controversial, privately owned central banks, which Congress would charter, then in the face of public outrage, uncharter over the years. Four years later, in 1785, the value of the new currency had plummeted. Inflation was rampant. Prices had risen by 72%. So, after a stiff battle, Congress killed this, the first privately owned central bank in America. Two years later, when it came time to write the Constitution in 1787, many of the delegates did not remember how well America's government-issued paper money had worked in Pennsylvania. They were still stung by the inflation of the Bank of North America and the hyperinflation during the Revolution, primarily caused by British counterfeiting. Strangely, the Constitution allows the federal government to borrow money, but is silent on the federal role in printing paper money, known in the language of the day as emitting bills of credit. This defect in the Constitution is at the root of all our economic problems today. Two years after the U.S. Constitution was signed, debt-free money was tried in Sweden in 1789, but with tragic results. To pursue a war with Russia, King Gustav III persuaded the Swedish Parliament to print debt-free money called Riksgalds. This was very costly to the bankers. Sweden had learned the secret of simply printing its own money without debt. In 1792, only three years into the experiment, King Gustav was assassinated by moneylender Jacob Johann Ankerstrom. As is frequently the case in time of war, too many Rixgalds were printed. The quantity was not controlled. A nation will sacrifice everything for survival during time of war. So inflation ruined the debt-free money experiment in Sweden by 1834, just as it had a few years earlier during the American Revolution, again 